Time for some systematic gemology today. And that means we're going to go through corundum in grand detail. So Roman numeral one for today's lecture is going to be corundum. And corundum is the mineral name for three different gem species that I know you've heard about. When it is red, it is called ruby. When it is blue, it is called sapphire. But maybe we should be more specific there and call it blue sapphire, like this picture up here, or the stunning blue one. Because sapphire can also occur, or corundum can also occur in many different shades of the rainbow. And when it is in any shade of the rainbow other than blue or red, it is called fancy sapphire. Okay, so this is all other colors. Whereas sapphire is blue and ruby is red. We're going to be on corundum for quite a long time, many little mini short lectures. Most of the figures from today's lecture come from a textbook from Lotus Gemology. And other resources are going to come from Gemological Institute of America, where I've received a lot of my training. Those are the sources for today's lecture. As we go through, oh, let's let's just show a picture of fancy. Here's a here's a picture from Lotus as well, showing fancy sapphires. And you can see that there are some normal sapphires, there are some rubies, but all these other shades, these are called fancy. Or yellow sapphire, green sapphire, orange sapphire. But that's the name that they're called. Well, let's put some ruby up here as well, just for completion purposes. Here's a unfaceted rough stone a preform, and then a final faceted cut. So as we go into corundum, we'll eventually have full lectures on ruby and sapphire and then fancy sapphire. But at first, I just want to start with general corundum. And so now let's just go into corundum mineralogy. In this section, we're going to hit composition, crystallography, physical properties like hardness, things that we've talked about over the course of the semester. Geologic occurrence, that's another one. So A, under corundum mineralogy, is going to be composition. Now it's not as simple as diamond, which has the chemical formula C, but it is still very simple because it's only made of two things. It's made of aluminum and oxide. Or oxygen. And there can be trace elements that occur in it as well. Trace impurities may occur at like one weight percent or ppm kind of levels. And these are things like iron, titanium, vanadium, and chrome. When uh, sapphire is totally pure, it is colorless. But, so let's just say pure equals colorless, but it's these, these trace impurities that will impart a color. Iron and titanium, for example, they make us go blue, and when we have red, it's because of chromium. Number two, our crystallography. Think back to the different crystal systems, triclinic, monoclinic, orthorhombic, these ringing a bell, hexagonal, isometric, I might have missed one, tetragonal. Well, the crystallography of corundum is hexagonal. And so when we, let's draw a, a crystal of corundum, most of the time corundum occurs as these hexagons. And they're not pure hexagons. Track with me here. What I'm doing is I'm drawing the top of a crystal. And then we draw this barrel shaped. And so what I'm what I'm actually trying to do here is I'm gonna to try to make it flare a little bit. And then I'm gonna make it come back down. We're gonna do it over here too. Make it flare. And then make it come back down. I'm gonna do it with the inside ones. Come back down. And then this. And we can connect the lines. Let's see. I'm drawing it with me here. This is taking some time, I know, but that's okay. Let's see. Here we go. 
So what I'm trying to draw here is this characteristic hexagonal column shape, but it's not just columnar. It tends to be this, this barreled by pyramid. That is generally how they look. I can prove that to you. Here's a picture from Lotus with some beautiful yellow and blue sapphires. And this is what I want you what I wanted you to see. I wanted you to see this uh, go back color. I think I can grab red here to point it out. We see that they're, the lines are not perfectly vertical, right? Instead, they tend to taper out and down towards the bottom. This one shows it very pronounced, and so does this one. And so here, these would be just classic bipyramids, the bipyramid, where this one here is more of the tapered barrel shape. In fact, I'm going to put the word taper here. Okay, so that's what we should expect sapphire and ruby, fancy sapphires to look like when we're pulling them out of the ground and they haven't been weathered at all. Did I put a two on that for crystallography? Yeah, one A composition. Whoa. Oh, what a mistake. What a mistake. B is crystallography. You guys are so frustrated with me right now. C is physical properties. Physical properties. Here we're going to talk about how hard it is and how it breaks. So number one is where is it on Mohs hardness? Mohs hardness. Well, you should know the answer to that. Here's Mohs hardness. We had this graph that goes like this. We had diamond. It was a 10, right? And topaz was an 8. Diamond was a 10. Quartz was a 7, Feldspar a 6, Appetite a 5, and sitting right here, number 9, is Corundum. So it's one of the hardest minerals on Earth. And that is important, actually, in its geologic occurrence because it means that it is very survivable. So most hardness is 9. This gives it a great survivability. And that's going to matter economically for jewelry. It's not going to break when you knock it into a wall. It's going to matter for geologic occurrence. It's not going to weather when it geologic occurrence. It's not going to weather when it's in a stream. And then the last thing, I guess, about survivability is that it's a fantastic abrasion tool. And so this can be an industrial purpose. Industrial purpose. It can be used in things like sandpaper. So that's one of the physical properties. Another physical property here is how it breaks. And the way that it breaks is with a basal parting. So cleavage isn't the thing that matters. Conchoidal fraction is not the thing. Fracture, instead it's a basal parting. And the way the basal parting works is if we remember that barreled shape, and I drew these lines that kind of came across it, these are our breaking planes. And so it often forms after it has had a chance to weather, it doesn't just sit as barrels because they break apart and instead you just get these tabular tabular hexagonal pieces that you can pull out of the ground. I'll show you a picture of this. I should probably show this to you earlier in the semester actually when we were talking about basal parting. But here's an example of the hexagonal crystal of corundum with a parting surface. So there is a a type of regular breakage that does occur. And then the third thing to talk about with physical properties is its density. It's a fairly dense mineral with a density of around 4. So technically I think it's 4.02. That'll vary somewhat with the amount of trace elements. But because of that density, it makes it fairly easy to gravitationally separate from other things. So density is this, and let's just write down here that it is um, fairly dense. and easy to separate by gravity. All right, that means in water. We showed pictures of that in one of the more recent lectures. All right, so capital D now. We're moving through all these different properties of corundum, not specific to sapphire or ruby, and that is occurrence. Okay, so oh my goodness, the handwriting is like a child. Occurrences. The most important thing about the, about the geologic occurrence is that it has to be a, we'll say this, must 
be in low silica uh, rock. Has to be in a low silica rock. And the reason why is the chemical formula is Al2O3. There is no silica in that chemical formula. And if you add just a little bit of silica, you're going to turn this into really common rock forming minerals like feldspar or mica. So let's just put a little caveat here. With minor silica, feldspar would be produced. And the world is full of feldspar. It's all over the place. And that's because silica is a very common thing. So we have to have some rare situation. And in fact, must be in low silica rock. We could put here in red that that is actually a rare thing. And that's why this is a rare gemstone. The type of rocks that it does occur in, it occurs in basalts. These are low, um, these are low silica environments. Oftentimes, they have a lot of iron and titanium in the sapphire when it crystallizes from basalt. When it occurs in marble, that's a situation that's the most pure. And sometimes, when it's this pure, it can also have small amounts of chrome, which leads to ruby. And then the third type of geologic environment that will produce this, the third rock type, is just from hydrothermal fluids. Right? These are all things we talked about earlier in the semester when we were all together. Hydrothermal fluids, and what happens here is that it's not, it's like a negative reaction almost, because what ends up happening is that the fluids strip silica from the rock. And as the fluids are stripping away silica from the rock, this may produce, may produce corundum as a result. All of these occur in different places on Earth. And then the fourth geological occurrence is, so what are these? These are all our primary occurrences, right? And so the, the second type here is the, or the, the other type here is the secondary occurrence as an alluvial gemstone. So the secondary deposits in, let's call it secondary in alluvial deposits. Why can this occur? Well, it's because the crystals are so hard. We'll even write a note here. Mohs of nine makes it survive. What else? There's one other thing. The density 4.0 density of around 4, right, which is very high, grams per centimeter cube, makes it, um, let's say, let's say, creates enrichment in gravels. So those are our four different geologic occurrences of corundum. Let me show you a couple pictures of each of these. Here's an example of we make this one actually a little bigger. Oh, that's beautiful. This is a ruby crystal, and it is occurring on this matrix. This is the rock that it formed in, and this is all calcite. So this is what this is white marble. Here's the other type of occurrence where we have a blue sapphire occurring within a basalt. In fact, this is so coarse grained, we might even call this an intrusive igneous rock as a gabbro. And then as our final occurrence, here we have a and I'm zoomed in on this on purpose. We don't show the actual rock, but can you see how rounded each of these sapphires are? These were pulled from an alluvial deposit. Their edges have been worn away by weather and erosion. All right, so that is corundum. We, oh, I didn't erase my notes from last lecture. Let's get rid of that. Okay, here we go. What I want to do now, let's go back away from this. We have a few minutes left, and so what I want to step to now is Big Roman numeral 3 under today's heading of Corundum, and that is our species of ruby. We're not going to finish ruby today, but we can at least get into it. This, importantly, of course, is our red Corundum. A under this is, let's just have a little fun with ruby right now and talk about where does ruby occur 
in our culture. It ends up being one of the most important gems today and throughout all of time. One of the things that matters about Ruby and culture is it is a birthstone. There goes my alarm telling me we need to wrap this up. That's how I will in the next minute or so. This is the birthstone of July. You know where else it is very common in our culture? It is mentioned in the Bible. It's actually mentioned at least eight times, not Bibles. Bible, eight times, often in referring to wisdom. Wisdom is more valuable than ruby. So remember that. Let's say uh, wisdom is more precious. All right, value wisdom, my young students. Uh, in Sanskrit, ruby is named the king of precious stones. And it actually is, even today, the most valuable gemstone. The most valuable, valuable gemstone. The most expensive gem ever sold, that's kind of a neat fact, it's called the Sunrise Ruby. Let me show you the, a picture of the Sunrise Ruby. This is the most expensive ruby ever sold. The stats on this ruby, let's just take a look at it for a second. It's end, it's end up in a, in a ring with these, there's a diamond on this side and a diamond on the, end, on the other side. They're about 2.7 to 2.5 carats. The ruby itself is from a place called Burma in Asia, and it's 25.6 carats. It's the perfect pigeon blood color. And this stone sold for $30 million in 2015. That's incredible. And the laboratories that graded this stone consider it to be the best large example of ruby tone, color, and saturation that exists. All right, it's a real stunner. And then I guess the last thing, let's just talk about U.S. imports. The U.S. imports a huge amount of rubies every year. Approximately 4 million carats we bring in, 4 million carats, and we spend about 150 million a year on ruby. Why do we buy so much ruby? Because we love it. It's important in our culture. All right, well, next class we will go through more of the science behind Ruby. See you then.